Hello and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Bryant and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have te technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is next week at the same time on September 30th, Hopping the Pond, First Steps to Finding Your English Ancestors with Rachel Darenthal. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on Are You Related to a Famous Ancestor? James has over 35 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and Rejoice and Be Exceedingly Glad. He is an author and co-author of over 25 books on genealogical research and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. And if James is ready, then we'll turn the time over to him. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me okay? That's great. Um, I'm James Tanner. Uh, as Brian mentioned, I am, and my wife, both of us are, mem are uh, volunteer missionaries at the BYU or Brigham Young University Family History Library. Unfortunately, since March, the library has been closed to everyone except um, staff at BYU and the students. So we are all working uh, from our homes. Uh, the BYU Family History Library is presently providing support. We will be beginning to um, uh, provide a live help desk during the day, and we will also uh, be available for by referrals from the library to answer personal, individual uh, genealogy questions that you might have. So if you contact the, the library either through email or telephone or whatever, you should be able to have one of the 145 missionaries help you uh, personally answer your questions. So today we're going to talk about are you related to a famous ancestor? And of course you have to here go to family traditions. And uh, it's one of the most more persistent things. Uh, it seems like family traditions can be transmitted uh, af generation after generation. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes the family tradition uh, kind of uh, drifts from one uh, kind of thing to another. So you can't always rely on it, but uh, it's a good starting place sometimes. And uh, one of the first ones, obviously, is do you have a family tradition of being related to royalty? And then the next one is, or are you related to a famous historical person like Daniel Boone? Uh, I was just commenting to Brian a few minutes ago that, that uh, my family did have a tradition. And we did have a tradition that we were related to Daniel Boone. And the reason that occurred was because Daniel Boone's mother was a Morgan. And one of my uh, surnames, uh, family surnames, my grandfather's uh, surname was Morgan. And so somebody assumed that we were related to Daniel Boone because his mother was a Morgan. The answer to that was easy. It took me about 15 minutes of research uh, in the family history library to determine that I was there was no way we were related to each other. Turns out that Morgan is an extremely common name in Wales, and that my ancestors came from Wales, and probably Daniel Boone's ancestors came from Wales. The the kind of the equivalent of that would be saying, "Well, my name's John Smith, and your name's." William Smith, and we must be related. No, okay. So that isn't the way that it works. And and uh, that's sometimes how some of these uh, traditional uh, handed down stories get get started. Or even an Indian princess. 
Um, as a matter of fact, there really are no Indian princesses, but that's a very common uh, family tradition. Um, you might think of Pocahontas as being a family, uh, as being a famous uh, Indian princess. Well, she wasn't a princess, but she was uh, an important person in their tribe. Uh, interesting thing about Pocahontas is she did marry an Englishman. She traveled to England and actually died in England, but she did have uh, one child. And yes, there are people who are descendants of Pocahontas. So it's, uh, you know, it can happen, but it's, uh, it's another thing to find that, to how that happened. So the question really is, and comes down to it, is how reliable are family traditions? And I'm, I'm going to have to qualify that by saying it would really, it really, really depends on the tradition. It may be as reliable as this car. On the other hand, it, it may be dead on that there is a tradition out there that is, um, that is provable and is real. And so it's, it's worth looking into the family traditions. Um, in my family, we have another tradition. It's in the form of a story about one of our ancestors. And in looking into the story, it turns out that yes, there is historical, historical documents that corroborate the, the act that, that, that there was, that the act happened, that what happened happened, but it was not, uh, not quite as much detail as is in the family tradition. And the other problem with the family tradition is that the only written transmittal that we have was made by a grandson who actually never talked to the person who was the um, topic of the, the person who was who, about whom the, uh, the tradition occurred. So you begin to look at these with a little bit more uh, kind of mm, questioning attitude. Um, so the, the first question I guess we come to is where do we start? What do we do if we uh, think that we're related to a famous person or if we want to join a, a, a lineage society, if we want to be a part of the Daughters of the American Revolution or uh, here in Utah, Daughters of the, of the Utah Pioneers. Uh, any of these kinds of organizations that are based on uh, on your being a descendant of somebody uh, that did something in the past or was participating in something, uh, whether, whether it was war, World War I, World War II, uh, Civil War, Spanish-American War, or if it was uh, some other type of, of uh, event or, or occurrence. And one of the most famous, obviously, that during this year, this is the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the pilgrims, the, the people, passengers on the Mayflower ship from England in 1620 on November um, 18th, if I've got that correct. And um, so that's another one of the organizations. Basically, when you get to, when you have this kind of a of a of an idea that you might be related, um, there's for example uh, programs out there that uh, will find your relatives and tell you uh, that you're related to this person. And there's uh, some promotional studies, some promotions done by. Um, some of the ma major genealogical companies and they have ads that say, are you related to, and then they'll have some movie star or, or pop singer or whatever, and they'll uh, ask if you're related to that person. And <clears throat> all of those are, are good motivations for people to start to look into their ancestry, but uh, we really need to start with yourself. And when we say that, what I'm saying about that is that you need to look at the information you have about yourself and then move back to your parents and then move back to your grandparents. And at each level, you need to, to make sure that you have historical sources, meaning documents, genealogically significant documents that document each step as you go back in time. And then as you do that, you may very well find out that there's some uh, pretty remarkable people back in your 
in your um, ancestry. But you have to work back generation by generation in time. Now, what happens if you jump into a program like uh, one of the larger uh, programs like Family Search or Ancestry or My Heritage or Find My Past or whatever? And uh, they have a family tree and they start suggesting names and things for you. That's possible, and it's very possible that you may find out through that process that you are related to somebody who was famous. And uh, But basically, you still need to, to go back and look at every one of those record matches or record hints or, or um, suggested resources and make sure that you're stepping back generation by generation in time and uh, making it uh, accurate. Now, in a lot of these, if you jump on to say, for example, family search, and you you start back, and uh, you know one of my granddaughters uh, one time was in a class, and they were uh, supposed to look at their ancestry, and they were looking at it on family search, and she just kept clicking back and clicking back and clicking back, and eventually she got back to Adam, and uh, then that was quite a quite an uproar in the class, and everybody wanted to come over and see and everything how she had gotten back to Adam. Well, it's not unusual to find uh, in the past uh, people who have created pedigrees that uh, purport to go back uh, to royalty or purport to go back to uh, uh, even to back to Adam in the biblical people. But the question about that is, is where are the sources? Where, how do you connect you individually back to that person with with records and documents that show that you really are the child of that parent, of that parent, of that parent going back in time. So one of the things you should start out doing with Family Search uh, and some of the other programs that I mentioned is to read the attached sources. Now, if there are no sources, then the rule very simple is that any information that is that it, that comes without a source is not believable. It's simply not supportable by any fact. Unless you have some source, it simply, as far as genealogical source is concerned, it doesn't exist. So many of the lines as you go back on a, on a program like Family Search, or if you look at other uh, at sources on, on ancestry family trees, you'll find out that there are no sources. There are either no sources or they may be just one source. And uh, uh, it, the source they have uh, may be uh, not, maybe not tell enough information to, to tell who the parents of that person are. So basically this is, the, this is how this process works. And, and to make that, kind of put that into a focus, then what I'm going to do is kind of work of it, work with that. Think of the sources as bridges to the next generation. Now, this is an old picture of a bridge called Navajo Bridge in over the Colorado River. Now, if that bridge wasn't there, what would be the chance of you getting from where, uh, from one side of this particular canon to, canyon to the other side of the canyon? Um, I can tell you that uh, it was very difficult and there were only three or four places along the entire portion of the of this of the canyons in northern Arizona that were where you could possibly cross the Colorado River until these uh, the, these bridges were made and so and actually right now there's only three major crossings of the Colorado four if you count uh, the ones up close to Colorado and New Mexico, there's really only three or four places on the Colorado River where you can cross the river uh, other than in a boat or whatever. So this is a, you know, this is a, a good analogy. It tells you that if you're trying to get from this person to their parents, you need a source that shows that this person is part of the family of those parents. And that seems to be real simple, but it is, it's really the basis of doing genealogy back step by step and verifying the information that you, 
that you have to have. So the rule is no sources, no connection. So unless you can show through some kind of historical source that a person really is the child of that parent, then there's no connection there. Now, you can say, you can argue and say, well, yeah, but there's, we know that there's a connection. Well, we know doesn't help. Uh, we know is not a source. So that's basically where we are. And it's important to understand that there are no shortcuts. Uh, there's no way you can jump um, from uh, a person that uh, your name is a person um, to back with a surname and go back and say, oh, therefore I must be related because I've got all this line. And well, they kind of lived in the same area and uh, it must have been related. Well, that may or may not be the case, but there's really no shortcut to getting there. You really need to, to make it step by step, going back generation by generation until you really understand uh, whether or not. But let me tell you another thing that's a byproduct of that and what help happens when you start going back into your genealogy and learning about these, uh, your, your ancestors. Uh, what happens is that you become involved with your ancestors and their stories and you find out that your ancestral stories are just as interesting, maybe even more interesting than the stories of some famous people. Your ancestors may not have been famous, but, or they might have been. You know, one of the rules I always say is that, yeah, kings and queens had children. Yeah, they did. And so there are descendants out there. But uh, on the other hand, uh, if, you, if you're thinking and, and some kind of value, making a, a value judgment and a value of what your life is about simply because you're related to some famous person, uh, you really need to get to know your ancestors because I'm sure you'll find that there are some wonderful and very inspiring and very great stories out there waiting to be told. Now, even if you go into a program, like I mentioned in Family Search or on Ancestry or whatever, you really need to look at all the sources and verify the sources. Uh, make sure they say what they say. Um, it's one thing to stick a, a source or, or do a reference to a book or something uh, and make that your, uh, your, your source, meaning it tells you that, yes, you're supposed to say uh, when this person was born and this is a source for that person. Well, yeah, but you have to make sure that, that what's cited there actually talks about the person's birth. Um, one thing that I find that's very common uh, on, uh, I'm just use Family Search as an example here, uh, it, on Family Search is that uh, there'll be an exact birth date for someone. Say back in 1700s, it'll say 5 April 1714. And you'll go and look at that and then you'll go through all the sources and there's no source for a birth. Nothing there on that's that's attached to that person, where anybody has shown uh, where that date came from. Well, then you can't you can't rely on that date. You can't believe that that's accurate. And so, basically, um, looking for uh, those sources, or you have to do all the research. In other words, if, if there are no sources, then someone, and if you're the one that's that that motivated and wants to, to, uh, to get uh, connected to one of these organizations or whatever, then you need to, to do that research yourself. And that doesn't mean you have, you're kind of left out there in left field and you can't do anything and you really can't help. You, need, you don't have anybody to help you. Um, most of the time, uh, these, uh, the organizations, the uh, surname organizations or or uh, affinity organizations such as uh, the ones that I mentioned, like the the war record, the war organizations, Revolutionary War, Civil War, whatever, and the uh, event organizations like the Mayflower, the passengers who who arrived on a ship in 1620. All of these um, organizations have resources, 
And usually those resources are very helpful in, in uh, establishing connections with their organization. So you can go out there and find information that, that uh, will help you and assist you in, in establishing that kind of a connection. But uh, remember this, that uh, fabricating a link is not allowed. It's, it's uh, you know, I've, uh, over the years, I've had a lot of people come to me, uh, particularly trying to be, to join the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution or uh, the Mayflower Society or one of those organizations. And they say, well, I know that my ancestors were defendant for the Mayflower and I've traced back my lineage back to this person. And then all of these people neck above him or in the back in the line are all verified parts of, you know, of the Mayflower people. And so I just know he's related. And then we go in and we look and we look at it carefully. And I say, well, you don't have anything that shows who these pers this person's parents are. So oh, how do you know that you're connected here? Well, I just know I'm connected. So that's that's kind of the attitude I get. But um, it, it really is self-defeating because if you if you start making this stuff up, which happens, by the way, unfortunately, then um, you're you're it doesn't it doesn't help. Uh, someone's going to come along and and find out and and, bear, and you know burst the bubble here, uh, take a pin to the balloon, and uh, and and indicate and show that you're not really related to that people. And it's often that these organizations will refuse membership because they, they don't believe that the information that you provide is accurate and, and they're going to verify it. They're not, they're um, usually have a staff of professionals and they will, will try to uh, verify that information. So start it with yourself but start doing some serious research about the ancestor. So if you think you're a descendant of a particular person, let's say um, you're a descendant of um, one of the, the, you know, one of the people, just anybody, you can pick anybody, president of the United States, um, a, a writer, an author, a painter, whoever it is, and somebody that you think is famous, then find out about that person. And the one thing you'll want to find out for sure is if they had any descendants. Um, it probably isn't a good idea. It's probably a good idea to find this out pretty early on. Find out if they did and who were their descendants, who were the people that they, uh, who were their children, who were their grandchildren. Um, and in some cases, uh, that information, the information about the individual and their children and perhaps even their grandchildren and sometimes even further down the line with uh, organizations like the Mayflower Society is, uh, is pretty common that they've actually done that research and they know who the descendants are. And so uh, you're going to have to connect to one of those descendants, not just to the individual that uh, is your, we'll call the target individual, the person who out there who you think you're related to. Okay, so I, I would think that the first thing you would want to do is look for published genealogies. Um, if, you were, if you were out there looking around for, um, um, and I, let me just go back to the Mayflower people. If you were out there looking around for information and you thought you were related to, to John Alden or William Bradford or Francis Cook or one of these, uh, one of the Mayflower people, then perhaps you should start finding out who they were. Maybe you should do some, some reading. Uh, go out and look and see if there's anybody's written uh, uh, some books about them. And if they have, and they may have written a genealogy of that person, and that may be published. You may have a published uh, genealogy that uh, uh, tells exactly who, was, uh, who, their, who their descendants were, like I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, you can go out there and find that information. 
And so basically the, the idea here is to do a, a fairly, you know, extensive search, libraries online, uh, look in the catalogs on uh, for the libraries, go to your library, see if there's any, or look in their library catalog today. I guess with the pandemic, we're not out looking in libraries so much, but we can still get in library catalogs. We can still see if they have books and we can start to see maybe some of those books are online and we can read the books uh, by checking them out and with uh, programs like Overdrive and a lot of the other libraries, some other libraries may have books available, digital books available. So doing this basic kind of, of, of historical background research will ultimately help you with your own research because it will give you an idea of the places and the time periods and what, what's going to be required to connect to one of these people back there. Um, if, if um, and the time period really is important, and it's important in the sense that um, the, the absolute fact is that as you go back in time, the number of records decreases. The, the number of available records, the number of records that have been preserved, uh, the condition of the records deteriorates, and uh, their availability becomes more and more difficult. Uh, to uh, to find. So you can't, as you move back in time, it's going to become more and more difficult. So the person you're picking, if you want to pick a person that uh, lived uh, in the in different years, um, it, it would be helpful if that person actually lived during a time period when there were records. Um, and when it was, uh, when the records were available and when the records talked about uh, people who might have been recorded as individuals. So, so what's the cutoffs? What are the parameters here? Well, we're talking about um, uh, lots of records for the uh, 21st century. Obviously, we're generating mountains of records and just overwhelming uh, numbers of records. A little bit less, fewer records in the uh, in the in the 20th century uh, in the in the 1900s. Um, back in the 1800s, you start to uh, get a little more difficult. And, uh, there's still lots of records in some areas. Some areas don't have records particularly. Uh, getting back into the 1700s, it doesn't really matter where you are. The records start to become uh, quite difficult to find. Uh, they're, uh, they get harder to read, as a matter of fact. and. Uh, and it becomes more and more difficult. And by the time you get back into the 1600s, uh, you're going to be almost learning new languages and you would be uh, finding that the very, very few records were available. And then if you'd get back into the 1500s, when you're starting in the 1500s, uh, many of the records disappear. For example, uh, the earliest parish registers in England that show any births, marriages, or deaths, um, there are very, very, very few records before 1538 when they actually, when uh, uh, King Henry VIII ordered that the parishes begin to, to keep records. So there's always a date back there in any place that you go that when the records are, are more and more difficult to find. Now, one thing that you need to realize is that there are lots of records. There are tens of thousands of surname books. Uh, I'd suggest you start with the Family Search Digital Library. You go to familysearch.org and go up under search, under the search menu up there at the top. That's right up here, oh, that search. And then you'll get records, genealogies, catalogs, and books. Now the books are not in the catalog altogether now. They're starting to kind of build up a crossover there, but there are well over, um, uh, 490,000 free digitized volumes on familysearch.org. Uh, and they're completely searchable. You can search every word. They've all been sent through optical character recognition and they, um, and you can search for names and, and uh, places and dates and all sorts of things. And if you get into that, uh, I think you'll find you may have, actually have a, uh, a surname book for your family. Uh, when I worked down in the Mesa, uh, Arizona Family Search Library, 
for uh, for quite a few years. Uh, we had a physical paper library, you know, thousands of volumes, and uh, many of those were surname books, and they were all around the walls of the library area in the family history library. And uh, people would come in and they'd be asking about their family, and we'd I'd say, well, why don't you get a surname book? We'd walk back and pull a book of one of their ancestors off the shelf. So you need to start with looking in through this for your your grandparents, your great grandparents, your great great grandparents, even back. Um, if you're if if there's something important that that person did in in Utah, for example, where we're here in Utah, uh, we talk about the pioneers, and uh, those were people who came uh, who crossed the United States back in the uh, between 1849 and eight and 1868, and uh, before the railroad. And pioneers are well documented, and so if you if you have a suspicion that one of your ancestors crossed the plains, then it might be a, it's as simple as looking on the fam on Family Search to find out a lot of information about that particular person. So we need to uh, you just need to start looking. So go to FamilySearch.org, and you'll find that. Uh, under the search catalog, you'll find the Family Search Digital Library. Just put in a term, a name, or whatever you want to do, and uh, and it'll start pulling up books, and you'll have uh, access to this. Now, some of the books may be restricted uh, to viewing in a family history library or a family history center. If that's the case, we've got a little bit of a problem right now because all of the family history centers and libraries are closed to patrons, uh, so you might have to wait. But what I would suggest with any book that you find on uh, in the Family Search Digital Library is copy the name of the book, get them, make sure you know the author, and then do a Google search for the book. You may find out that the book is someplace else, and that there are other libraries. The fact that the book was digitized may mean that it was digitized and available on a variety in different libraries, not just the Family Search Library. So, you need to go there and and uh, do an additional search out there for information. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, royal families have descendants, but here's the rule: if you are a descendant from royalty, you probably you probably already know that. And why is that the case? Because royalty and nobility are really different things. When we talk about royalty, we're talking about kings, and we're talking about succession, meaning who's going to be the king next. And if you know anything about that, if you've been following the news with Queen Elizabeth and her children, you realize that it's there's endless speculation, endless news, endless things about all of the people. If there's anybody that's even arguably possibly could become the king then then there's uh, going to be information and those people all know who they are they're painfully aware of it from the time they can learn to speak that they are descendants of a king and they are told and they are educated and if it's if it's european monarchies and and uh, and in uh, in europe uh, they they all know each other. They are, they're all intermarried. They're all uh, not all, but uh, substantially re related in some way to another. Lots of them are, and so uh, kind of claim that you're the, the 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 descendant of a of an illegitimate son of one of the kings, or that you are, you know, whatever is probably not going to go very far. Now, the practical reality is this, that if you're if it, here in the United States, um, we, have, we have a whole set of people who emigrated uh, beginning in the early uh, 1600s to America from various places in Europe, and even earlier, obviously, from Spain and uh, 1500s. And uh, so we have people in the Americas who are descendants. And the question is, are any of these people descendants of royalty? 
um, it's possible. It is, it is entirely possible, but that they were an overlooked person of royalty, then it's not likely. Now, what about nobility? Now, that's a whole different, different world. Nobles are, I'm not going to say uh, common, but they are, there is a far larger uh, pool of nobility. And to be related to a noble, you may or may not know that. And so it's very, very possible to trace back. But if you get related to a noble, it's very, it may be possible that as you do your research that you really are related to a king because they, really, because they did have children. But uh, it, it's, it's, it's just interesting that um, a lot of people claim that they go back to a, a nobility and some of them have extremely well-documented, extremely uh, uh, done extremely well and they're, and I agree, they are. They're, that's who their ancestors were. And why they're not famous or why they, they're, they're, they're uh, not recognized as part of the royal family is maybe some historical circumstances. A lot of these kings didn't have good ends. They, uh, you know, some of them are almost written out of history because they, were not popular with the people who came after them. And so uh, it, there's, there's lots of here. It's interesting, and but I'm going to, another thing you should understand is that, that you're not stepping out into a vacuum. You're stepping out into uh, a tremendously well-researched uh, area. And uh, there's lots of different ways to get to that. Uh, one of the ones I'd mentioned initially is that on family search, there's a section called genealogies, which is right next to the one for books. And what you do on your search menu and the genealogies, there are um, community trees. And one of the community trees, by the way, is, a, is a, a very exhaustive, complete listing of the royal families of England, of Europe. And so all there's, the thousands and thousands of names in there going back into, you know, the antiquity. And so everybody's there. It, it's all, they're listed as much as they can. They have people working on it from time to time, adding in any new names, doing research, making sure all the information is correct. And uh, so that all that information out there, um, but you're still going to have to go the step-by-step -step to get back to the point where you connect with somebody uh, that, that is uh, that works back in the relationship back to one of these people. Now, the next step is to check to see if the famous ancestor is mentioned in a genealogical organization. And, and I, because this is the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower, I decided that I would go ahead and use that as an example. So here's the General Society of the Mayflower Descendants. It's known as the Mayflower Society. And they have, according to their statistics, 35 million, more or less, of descendants of the Mayflower passengers. And um, the question is, are you one of them? And they have extensive documentation that allows you to, um, to, to discover that information. So if you look for surname organizations or immigrant societies or or uh, war societies or whatever, uh, you may very well find they have, uh, like I mentioned, a, a lot of their documentation available. So here's some examples of uh, these different kinds of societies. Um, there are hundreds of them, hundreds of these. And if you start looking, um, if you were the first, if, you, if, there, if there was a place in the United States where somebody settled first, there's possibly an organization of people who are descendants from those first settlers. So it's, it's like any place where people came, there's going to be another organization or historical society or uh, whatever that has been founded. And there's just hundreds of these out there. This one's the California Society. And it's uh, of all the families that received large land grants from Spain and Mexico. And in one case, going back, um, I had a friend who came to me with a piece of paper 
that was his all he knew about his family. It was uh, name of his grandmother and some of his aunts and un some of his aunts and uncles and his mother's name. He didn't he he knew who his father was, but he really there was kind of no relationship there, and he wasn't interested. And that's all he knew. And I was able to trace him back to one of the land grant families in in uh, California. And so he could technically have joined one of these societies and they have, turns out, quite a bit of information about his ancestors. So it was kind of a, a, a very interesting an experience. Of course, there's the Daughters of the American Revolution and they have uh, extensive, very, very extensive uh, resources, a library, a museum, they have online resources, uh, they, they uh, have local state chapters. Uh, uh, you, can, you can hook up with these people and uh, if you do happen to have uh, their, their, their definition of, of, of someone who was involved with the Revolutionary War is very broad. Uh, they will include people who substantially contributed to the revolutionary cause, never fought in the war, were never soldiers, didn't have anything to do with being involved with the battles, but they were people who supported the war to some extent. And they're, they qualify. So you need to look at, when you go to these societies, you, the first thing you should do is, what does it take to join? And you may find out that you don't even have to be part of the group that they're celebrating. So there's another society here, uh, Order of the First Families of Virginia, 1607 to 1624-5. Now, this is, a, uh, is distinct from uh, somebody who fought or, or helped with the Revolutionary War or someone who, was, who have a land grant. These are the first families, are the, per are the permanent colonies uh, after Jamestown. And they're the people who, uh, who are descendants of those early um, settlers and the you know, immigrants from, uh, to Virginia. So, and if you read down what they're saying down there about them, they publish definitive gene uh, work on Virginia genealogy. In other words, tying into one of these organizations and one of these families may you may not end up finding a, a a famous person, but you may find a tremendous amount of information about your family and be able to uh, to get into uh, professionals who are have spent you know hundreds of millions of dollars researching and uh, and looking through all of this information in one of these particular areas. Um, another one is the Order of the First Families of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. And uh, you can look on there. Uh, some of them have lists of surnames. And they say, well, these are the people, the surnames. If you find this surname in, in Rhode Island, then you probably can trace it back to uh, and become a member of this organization. But uh, once again, it, it, re it requires you to do a substantial amount of research. In every case here, uh, they're going to require, in, in almost every case, they're going to require substantially valid reviewed um, applications for, for uh, membership of these organizations. And if you look at it from that standpoint, you realize that even if there's not an organization out there that has has um, shown what's happening, you know, in other words, is, is uh, uh, for that particular individual that you think you're related to, then, uh, but there may be one, an associated organization that, um, that basically would be someone who would do it. Now, I, I mentioned at the beginning, I mentioned Daniel Boone, and I'm just going to keep going here, but uh, that Virginia, the, the Virginia organization, say if you were one of those original Virginia people, then you probably, you know, then, then you would have a chance at least of being related to somebody like Daniel Boone, who, uh, whose family was one of the original families in Virginia. 
So now here's a really interesting one. I just threw one in here just for kind of a, give you a little bit uh, more information than uh, about this type of organization. National Society for the Descendants of American Farmers. What's the requirement here? That your ancestors were farmers. I can give you a like 85% mm, chance if you go back into the 1800s, somebody was a farmer. So kind of a uh, really, um, you know, kind of, uh, well, interesting organization. So if you're, if you're interested and like to belong to organizations, then there's lots of them out there that you can look at. They're local, they're regional, they're national. Um, there's a number of them here in Utah and uh, you're, you're, uh, uh, and you're going to find that there's lots of societies and things, and they're all, you know, they're they're going to be people who are who are interested in that area and that society, and it's interesting. And like I mentioned, they may have a list of approved ancestors families, and uh, I'll get into that just a little bit more again. But I'm going to have to mention that you may have to submit a verified pedigree to qualify to join some of these organizations. You can't just say, oh yeah, I'd love to be a member. They'd say, well, then fill out the application. We'll have it reviewed by our genealogist board and we'll see whether or not you actually qualify. And they'll usually come back and say, no, you don't prove that this person was the son or daughter of this person. And so we can't we like you to do it. We'll help you with that, but you know, so it's it's kind of the that kind of organization. So let's look quickly here at a case study how it would work. Uh, I chose one of my own traditions that I've already mentioned that my Tanner family uh, we have an ancestor who was a passenger on the Mayflower. Um, when I was younger, uh, that's all I knew, um, and I had. Uh, pretty common, fairly limited understanding or, or of who the Mayflower, what the Mayflower was. I knew that they were pilgrims and because my family had traveled, I, we'd been to Plymouth and I'd seen uh, Plymouth Rock and, you know, and then they'd say, well, you know, one of your ancestors was on the Mayflower and I would go, okay. But as I got into genealogy a little later in my life, I decided to take that seriously. So I have to going to show how the connection was verified. I'll start with my great grandfather. Okay, assuming that you have verified back to your great grandparents, that they're a good place to start on any kind of research because they're usually, uh, if you get back, they're usually born, uh, depending on how old you are, of course, they may be born uh, as much as 75 to 100 years before you were born. And that gets you started back quite a ways. Okay, so if I was looking at it generation by generation, I would have started with myself, my parents, my grandparents, and my great grandparents. And I did that, and it was pretty well verified. And I um, uh, even knew uh, one of my great grandparents uh, quite well during most of my early life. And I knew some of my, uh, I knew pretty much about all of my great grandparents. So that was not, that was an easy thing to do. And it was the Tanner line, so that was even easier. My great grandfather, Henry Martin Tanner, was born in San Bernardino, California, and died in Gilbert, Maricopa County, Arizona in 1935. So I didn't ever know him. He was, he died before I was born. And uh, we'll notice here, uh, that as I worked on this, I uh, primarily and a few other people added 132 sources. What does that mean? It means it's a large number of sources. It means that I know a lot about Henry Martin Tanner and there are entire books written about him. And so there's a, a lot of information. It's not, uh, I have no question that I'm related to him. Uh, I've had, uh, if you want to go that far, you, I have had DNA tests that show that I'm related to him. So there's not really any kind of question here. But we're going to take a step back. And the next step back is his father, Sidney Tanner. So the question is, in each of these, is uh, how do we know Sidney Tanner was Henry Martin Tanner's father? Well, 
if we if we look at that, um, and I'm going to have to go back here if I can. Let's see. Uh, we have 128 sources for um, Sidney Tanner and 110 memories, meaning we have documents and all sorts of things. And uh, we have sufficient information to show that Sidney Tanner's family and all of the members and all of his children and Henry Martin Tanner was one of his children. We have that documented. So we've spent a tremendous, uh, really tremendous amount of time and we know that Sidney Tanner's, who is, he was. Now, who are, who was Sidney's parents? Well, John Tanner was Sidney Tanner's parents. And for the Tanner family, John Tanner is the famous relative because he was the one, first of all, who uh, joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was also a pioneer, crossed the plains, and he had a huge family. And there are tens of thousands of people who are descendants from John Tanner. Uh, his life is also well documented. Again, you'll see there's lots of memories, lots of sources, documents, uh, things that, that do. But here's the interesting story. The story was that when I started doing research into John Tanner, notwithstanding the fact that he had thousands of descendants, no one had ever looked, produced his, anything that showed he was, who he, where he was born, his birth record of all. If he had a birth record, no one had found it. And so although we knew that his parents were, were um, Joshua Tanner and Thankful Taft, we didn't, how did we know that? And I'll, the only way I found that was by going into where he was supposed to have been born in Hopkinton, Washington County, Rhode Island and looking back through the town records, page by page by page, day after day after day, until I found his birth record, where the town clerk wrote down his parents' names and the birth dates, their marriage date, and the birth date of each of their children for the, for the town record. So that was the, that established that John Tanner was the son of thankful Teft, and she's the one that we we're, we start to be concerned about. Now it gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, we've got, you see the number of sources drops uh, by about half, and the number of memory starts to get real thin because this was, uh, we're getting back into the 1700s. She was born in 1757. Now we're still in Rhode Island, so we're, we're uh, we've got some some pretty substantial Rhode Island records, but then it gets to be more and more difficult to find the information. So we're, we've established that Thankful Teft was John Tanner's, Tanner's uh, parents, parent, mother. So the question is, is there a source that indicates that Thankful Teft was John Tanner's mother? Well, yes, there is. Like I mentioned, I found that information in the in the town records in Hopkinton. So now we have to establish who Thankful Teft's parents were. Now we're getting down into the 49 sources uh, dropping with only a few documents and memories. Uh, and uh, still that information was not only uh, substantiated, but we have information that uh, indicated that William Teft was Thankful Teft's father. And now we have to go to William Taft's mother, Esther Brownell, and we're back another generation. But by the time we get here, we get into an interesting situation. We've asked the same questions for each additional generation. But when we get to these people, we run into something really interesting, and that is the General Society of Mayflower uh, passengers, or descendants, excuse me, of Mayflower descendants, has published a series of books called the Silver Books. And the Silver Books are documented gener um, genealogies of each of the surviving passengers of the Mayflower. About half of the passengers died during the first year and have no descendants. So there's about 27 families of which there are descendants and that 35 million people are now descended from. 
but they have documented the first five generations from each of the people as far as it is possible to do. They've spent over a hundred years doing this. They have spent unimaginable amounts of money and time. And those books are published. You don't have to go anywhere except to those books to get the five generations down from the Mayflower. So once you're here, you're talking about Mary Cook, who was a born in Plymouth Colony, and notice the dates and places, 1652. And when you get, and you'll notice also the line goes back through the mothers, which uh, by the way, and normally would be extremely difficult. And then from Mary Cook, you go to John Cook, who was her father, and he was a passenger on the Mayflower. See the little Mayflower guy here. And his father, of course, was also a passenger. And so these were the verified passengers going back. So what does that look like? Well, this is a, uh, a out of family search, family tree, and it shows all of those direct line ancestors going directly back to Francis Cook and to his wife. Then again, it turns out that one of the other passengers, um, one, John, Moore, uh, John Cook, the son who was a passenger as a boy, a 13 year old, he, married Sarah Warren, who was the daughter of one of the other passengers, who was Richard Warren. So actually, we're descendants of three different passengers on the Mayflower. So this is how it works. You work your way back, and uh, unfortunately, in this case, you would connect to a, uh, um, to the, to the very much of the information that's uh, been done. And I mentioned earlier, and here's the, the link to it, it shows you the community's Prees project that has an extension collection of families with peerage gentry and colonial American connections. So go there and look at that. And there's This is the page out of the Family Search Research Wiki that explains about each of the projects that's in the community trees. So don't be disappointed that if you don't turn out to be a descendant of the person you thought you were or, of the, or connected to the Revolutionary War or whatever, just be glad you now have a verified lineage and that uh, you have probably, and if you spent some time learning about your ancestors, as I said earlier, you may very well be impressed with how, with some of their marvelous stories. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Any questions out there in the world? Awesome, thanks James. It looks like we have a question. It says, how much can we rely on Relative Finder? <laughs> well, okay, Relative Finder is only as accurate as the family search family tree. And in my case, um, Relative Finder, uh, it, it, it depends on how much work you've done. Now. Obviously, we've we've uh, uh, verified the the line from me back to uh, the Mayflower people. So when it shows that I'm related to the Mayflower people, I'm not surprised. But when it starts showing that I'm related to some of these other people out there, um, the answer is I no, I'm not, because there is no connection. Even though there's names and things in the family tree, there are no sources that show that that is an actual connection. So, you know, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting program. And if it's an incentive to you to do some research and see how that line is verified, then um, I suggest you do it. Now, uh, coming up in the Sunday programs, we don't have the schedule yet, but I'm going to be talking about breaking through brick walls for uh, a, a number of classes, kind of a series and on these Sunday afternoon classes. Uh, we don't know, I don't have the schedule yet, so it, whether it'll be on Sunday or another day, but you'll see it on the BYU Family History Library website. And if you wanna tune in there, I'll get into a lot lot more detail if I go for five weeks on, uh, on getting back to some of these people and seeing what kind of, what kind of reality there is in the, in the family tree. Awesome. And we have another question from Helen. It says, did you find a negative response from family members 
to your report that you're not related to Daniel Boone? <laughs> no, because I don't think very many of them knew that tradition. It was one I ran across in uh, from one of my from one of my grandmothers, and uh, uh, I don't see anybody claiming that. So that's not. It doesn't happen to be uh, an issue. It's too bad, but we. It's very possible that you do because some of these traditions are very, very ingrained, um, and uh, so they have, you know, they they might be upset. Sometimes it's the negative, the other side of it, that when you prove that you are related to a certain ancestor, that everybody's upset. That's sometimes the the the, uh, the reality of what happens. And this next question is from Kathy, and it might be in reference to an earlier slide, but it says, are some of the sources duplicates? Um, when you, yeah, if you're saying that duplicates, um, the sources that you mean of all those large numbers, yes, some of those sources are duplicates, but they come from different places. A source is, tells you where to find the information. And uh, if you, for instance, had a, a census record and you found it on Family Search, and then you went and found the same census year on Ancestry, that's two sources, two places where you can go look for information. So we we don't necessarily mean that you know that having all those sources is duplicate, but in those cases with those numbers. Uh, there's surprisingly few duplicates like that. There's a lot of information about these people, just overwhelming amounts. Uh, people like Henry Martin Tanner has, he has so many descendants. Just He lived in uh, Arizona primarily. He was born in California and, and uh, parents lived in Beaver, Utah, came to Arizona. He had uh, 17 children and most of those grew to adulthood and had lots of children. And so that we estimate in the tens of thousands of descendants. So yeah, there's a lot of information out there about Henry. There's a whole library, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, 17 feet, linear feet of library shelf dedicated to the papers dealing with, with Henry Martin Tanner. So a lot of information. Great. And um Bob asks, what is Relative Finder? Relative Finder is a program that was written by the BYU Technology Lab. If you go to BYU Technology Lab, search for that, you'll find all their really, really nice, really interesting and really useful programs. Relative Finder uses the information in the family search family tree to show how you are related to all sorts of people, primarily famous people, uh, signers of the Declaration of Independence, uh, all sorts of people like that. And so uh, if you, uh, and everyone else, and one of the things that it does is if you have people um, using Relative Finder um, in a group, then it will show you how you're related to people in a group. So that, so we at the library and the missionaries of the library, uh, most of us are all on Relative Finder. And it turns out that I have several relative cousins who are missionaries with me at the Family Search Library. And, I mean, the Family History Library at BYU. Awesome. And it looks like the last question um, comes from Colby. And he asks, where is this picture taken on this last slide? <laughs> <laughs> Do, who wants, who, who can, can anybody want to guess what this is? <laughs> this is an actual picture that I took at the Matterhorn in Switzerland. So awesome. That's what Steve guessed. Yeah, this is the Matterhorn. It's a little bit of different view than you're nor you're used to seeing. And uh, usually it's blue skies and you know, whatever. But this is more reality. And uh, there's a, a cog railroad that runs up um, the side of the mountain and it gives you views like this. And I took this picture standing in the cog railway, bracing myself in the window, leaning out the window, taking pictures. So I thought it was pretty remarkable that they actually came out without being blurred, but I guess I was shooting them pretty fast. Definitely, looks like a great picture. <laughs> well, awesome, that looks like that. It is all the questions for today. Okay. 
Um, thanks so much for presenting, James, and thanks everyone for joining us. And Thank be you. sure to oh, stop sharing. Okay, you stop me sharing. There we go. <laughs> and be sure to join us next week for our webinar at the same time, Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Um, on the 30th, Hopping the Pond, First Steps to Finding Your English Ancestors with Rachel Darenthal. So we hope you all can make, we hope you can all make it to that. And thanks for joining us today and have a okay. great day. Thank you. See ya.